But I do, if you if you would allow me to back up a little bit, because you said you were surprised to find out that I uh, grew up in, in Iran. Uh, yes, I was in Iran, and you know, my time in Iran shaped me, because what I'm doing today is what I experienced in Iran. I was in Iran from 1977 to 1980, on and off. Uh, I was there, I saw how a previously Western-oriented country run by the Shah uh, from one day to the next turned into a Sharia-dominated the the theocracy. Um, my father was there when in Iran, in Tehran, his office actually overlooked the American embassy mm. where the hostages were held. My mother cooked for the hostages who were held at the foreign ministry, you know, Bruce Lane and, and that group. And I was seven years old at the time, eight years old, and this change between freedom and absolute non-freedom, seeing that at the age of seven, eight, uh, the, the, all of a sudden the change from, from uh, Western clad women, Western clothed or non clothed women, <laughs> to all of a sudden completely uh, in, in black garments, not, you know, hardly showing uh, a face, um, to all of a sudden you can't have Pepsi. Pepsi was no longer sold in the stores. You know why? Because it reminded people of whiskey. 7 Up was no longer sold in stores because it reminded people of vodka. That's <laughs> That is Khomeini's uh, theo theocracy for you. That's how I grew up. I grew up, there wasn't enough food because there were food shortages. My mother didn't know how to feed my sister and me. Um, but it was actually the, the, the freedom that was lost which made a huge impact on me. And uh, this is how my relationship with Islam started. So it wasn't exactly something that just popped up uh, it wasn't something I, there wasn't an epiphany for me on September 11th, mm -hmm. I have to admit that, because I knew all along that that's what it was, it was dangerous, I didn't want to live like that. Um, it, it, it wasn't a surprise, September 11th was not a surprise, uh, and, and it didn't change my life in the sense that it changed many other people's lives. What did change my life was November of 2009. Uh, where all of a sudden, uh, at the end, it's actually now sort of the anniversary, now that we're sitting here, this is the anniversary. All of a sudden I found out that uh, some of my seminars that I had been giving for the uh, xenophobic Freedom Party, which uh, ironically is currently uh, in negotiation talks uh, to be part of the newly formed government in Austria, so they're no longer xenophobic and evil or anything. Oh yeah, uh, I had been holding seminars explaining to ordinary citizens what Islam and Sharia law were all about. And that didn't uh, appeal to the leftists who sent in a reporter to uh, infiltrate and to record, surreptitiously record my seminars. Uh, there were, it, was, it was three seminars, uh, four hours each, so 12 hours worth of transcripts which were then sent to uh, the prosecutor's office and the prosecutor, uh, public prosecutor immediately filed charges. And uh, I hired the best lawyer there is, Mr. Michael Rami, and uh, he did the best he could. Uh, first, the charge was incitement to hatred. And when the whole thing uh, went to trial, the judge listened to the tapes, played it, you know, for everybody to hear. And when she realized that there was nothing that incited, incited to hatred, she decided to add a new charge, which mm. under Austrian uh, law, a judge is allowed to do. Mm. It's outrageous for you, Debbie, probably. It's outrageous for everybody here in the US. During the trial, she added another charge because she saw she couldn't get me on the original charge. The, the charge was denigration of religious teachings of a legally recognized religion in Austria, and uh, it, con it concerned my statement, which wasn't really a statement, it was actually a rhetorical question. Listen to this. 
I said, what would you call Muhammad's behavior towards Aisha, the child bride, if not pedophilia? That outraged the judge, and she said uh, that this is punishable and uh, prosecuted me according to the denigration of religious teachings. We knew right away, my lawyer and I uh, knew right away that, uh, of course, uh, I didn't stand a chance, which at the end of the day I didn't. And uh, the judge found me guilty on, uh, on this charge, which actually amounted to a blasphemy charge, uh, because I said something that Muslims do not like to hear, which is the definition of blasphemy, as you might uh, explain later, or, or Debbie. Um, yeah, so she found me guilty, I had to pay a fine, or I was ordered to pay a fine or face 60 days in jail. And the reason why, just to explain to our uh, viewers, uh, the reason why this was so outrageous is because Muhammad, according to traditions, married a six-year-old and consummated the marriage when she was nine. Now, as a mother of a daughter, uh, at the time, she was the age of Aisha. Uh, I didn't really appreciate this, and uh, I saw all the child marriages going on. Uh, you know, I, I read the reports, and I saw it with my own eyes in Iran and other places. I didn't think that was what I envisaged for my daughter's future, and I still don't. So this is what I dared to ask, and I was found guilty. Uh, I took this, uh, I appealed the the uh the verdict twice all the way up to the supreme court of course i was denied any chance any appeal um even though the the judge agreed he actually stated for a fact that we all know that muhammad married a six-year-old no. consummated the marriage so now we have it on the record everybody knows that it's a historical fact now according to uh, uh the judge um, but uh, what happened to me is I, I shouldn't have said it in that way. So my, it was an excess of opinion, which is just ludicrous. It was crazy, and I, I'm not supposed to say it this way. Now, because I'm in the United States, I will say it. What do you call Muhammad's <laughs> behavior if not pedophilia? And thanks to the First Amendment, I'm allowed to say it. Once I step on the plane back to Europe, I'm no longer allowed to say it. So thank God for the First Amendment. And that brings me back to why we're sitting here. Please, everybody out there, the First Amendment is what still gives you some semblance of protection, but you've got to fight for it. And uh, you must protect the First Amendment at all costs. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. We really appreciate it. And, uh, not only are we, um, are, do we sympathize with what you have gone through, um, but we want to make sure that people understand that Elizabeth's experience is something that any of us could go through, that you could go through, right? We, we, this is what, this is our future, this is America's future. This is when we, every time you hear hate speech, every time you hear hate incident, every time you hear hate crime, every time you hear hate group, every time you hear all of these horrible terms being thrown around all of these smears, understand that this is something that we've seen play out um, and it ends not just in Austria, it ends much uglier, much uglier, because this is not the end of the road. This is only the beginning. Mine was the beginning. That's Can right. I just, before uh, we turn to Claire, uh, yeah. I need to add that, of course, I appealed all the way to the Supreme Court in Austria and lost, but my case is still pending and has been pending uh, since 2011 at the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, the, the case has been accepted, but we are, my, my lawyer and I are still waiting for a decision. And uh, let me just add, I'm wondering why no decision has been published. Mm -hmm. I leave it to you to draw your own conclusions. Yes.